Um, so yeah, so what I do now is instead of spending six to seven weeks in this, in the anatomical adaptation <coughs> phase, what I do is first two weeks, we're doing breathing, we're doing glute recruitment, we're doing almost like PT type of work. We're doing um, hinging patterns. I wanna see what I'm working with. Because if this is my team, and you two have collapsed arches, and you three have tight hips, and you know you four have poor shoulder mobility, it's like I gotta put together a program that caters to a lot of people with different muscle imbalances and different abilities, and it's, 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 it's hard. So I gotta figure out what I'm working with first, then I can figure out how to cater my program so that I can make the substitutions that I need to. Um, but now with the triphasic program, what I do is, the first time they do squats, it's, it's um, isometric. So the first two weeks they're squatting, we're doing three sets of 10 holding the bottom for three seconds. So number one, what it does is it checks, mainly my male athletes, it checks them because they can't put as much weight on the bar. And it's not about weight, it's more so about just stressing your body so, it's, so it has to uh, adapt. And that's what Caldeans talks about is, is the stress. We know about the said principle, specific adaptations to impose demands. We're placing a hell of a amount of stress in the body so it's forced to adapt to get stronger. Was I doing that before? To an extent, yes, but this is a lot more stress on the body. So we'll do that. And this is just in regards to the main lift, which is the back squat. Uh, then when we get into probably week four-ish, then I drop the reps down. So week four, and it's appropriate, right? Because of the the pausing or the eccentric or whatever, it, you can't put as much weight on your body, but you're still getting stressed, does that make sense? Like you're still getting a ton of stress. So we'll do four sets of four or four sets of three, and I do two weeks of eccentric, so two weeks where their partner's spotting them and their partner's make, counting to five. One, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand, four, one thousand, five, one thousand, drive out. I want to hear them counting. Because if you're cheating your partner, you're not helping them get stronger, right? We want to make this as stressful as possible. And you have a spot if you can't get out. So we do that for the first two weeks. The next two weeks is isometric, so they're pausing for five. Last two weeks is concentric, and you'll be surprised week six or so, the amount of weight they're pushing during those concentric weeks. And nine times out of 10, it's more than they squatted before. So we're already stronger than we were before and we haven't even tested yet. We're not even going off of specific numbers. Um, so that's, for me, that's what this phase is, above 80%, though they're not working at it specifically, they don't know what 80% is, it's, it's heavy. Then we test, and then I come down here, 55 to 80%, that's the high force, high velocity phase. So. Before, it was just a, kind of a slower bar. It was a lot, of, um, a lot of force production, not a lot of velocity. Then we go into this next phase where it's high force, high velocity. So now the bar is moving quickly. We're pushing weight faster, and this is when we start to see the athletes actually performing uh, better in their sports. Now they're running faster, they're sprinting faster, they're changing direct directions faster. There's more speed behind the ball if they're pitching or throwing. That's when we really start to see changes and then after that we kind of go through a peaking phase. We're not peaking for anything specifically, but I just want to kind of have them moving the bar really fast at a lighter at a lighter weight. So Caldeets, triphasic, I create monsters on this program. It's I, I can't even describe if anybody who's gonna be interested in pursuing strength and conditioning, it would be a disservice for you to not at least learn this program, I'm telling you. Because what I did before worked, <coughs> people were getting stronger retesting versus pre-testing. But if the bars, if you're not pushing weight fast, you're not gonna be fast in your sport. So it's not just about being stronger in the weight room. That's not, it's a goal, it's not the goal. We're not power lifters. We're not Olympic weight lifters, right? We, we play sports, right? That's the athletes I work with play sports. So if I can get them to this phase and they're pushing that bar up quick, that's when it transfers to the sport and that's what it's all about. It's gotta transfer. Does it matter if they're getting stronger in the weight room if it's not transferring to their sport? Does that make sense? Okay. And this was just kind of like, you know, I have like a, a four day split day two protocol. I have like a four day split day one protocol. I don't even know if you can see this, but I've got my belly breathing. I've got my glute work. Uh, I've got my uh, hip mobility work. And you know, we're not doing much day one except for like, not day one, um, day one, we're doing maybe some body weight squats, but like the next time I see them, maybe goblet squats where they're pausing or what have you. Like we don't put a bar on your back until probably beginning of week three, maybe. I want to make sure people are moving as, as mechanically sound as possible before I start to load them. Okay. Pull-ups and push-ups are important. Um, 
Can I have two volunteers to come up here and just do some put, like two push-ups so we can look at some pelvic and spinal stability? One, what's your name? Twan. Twan, let me have you come up here. Anybody else? Push up. Okay. So we'll have you guys face this way, maybe stagger. So maybe you come up a little bit in front of him and you can back. Yep. So just hold the top of your push-up real quick. So straight arm, yeah, top of push-up. Feet a little bit wider, arms locked. So what am I looking for? I want them to protract, so, so not squeeze, but pull those shoulder blades apart. We're protracted, shoulders are stable, right? So pull those shoulder blades apart, push yourself away from the floor. So we're here, right? Try to pull your shoulder blades. There you go, a little bit more, pull them apart, pull them apart, pull them apart. And this is it, scapular retraction, protraction. Can we, can we protract? So he's protracted, she's retracted a little bit, arms are locked. So I'm looking at shoulder stability, right? Are we stacked, shoulder on top of the wrist? Pelvic stability. Is there too much of a curve here? Or, so are our glutes not firing? So let's have you both squeeze your glutes really tight, squeeze. Boom, now we get that neutral spine. Okay, a little bit of a break here. So now we've got the shoulder stability, we've got the pelvic stability. Um, now keep your glutes tight. Okay, go ahead and do your push-up as low as you can go. And then drive back out, okay? So do we, can we protract here, can we protract here? Just keep, keep, keep those glutes tight, keep those glutes tight. So this shows me a lot, this shows me, do we have some weak glute issues? Do we have some pelvic stability issues? Because if so, they're, nice job, thank you guys. If so, then I know, okay, I'm gonna have to have this person do way more glute work that they're supersetting with their, with their, with their workouts um, to try to get them ready to load their bodies. Um, so that's why I do a lot of shoulder mobility, I do a lot of hip mobility. It's, it's assessments, but it's also letting them know there's a lot of people who think they're strong and they can't do a push-up right, you know, or a lot of people think they're strong and they can't do a pull-up properly. So it also kind of lets them know we still have some work to do. So that's pretty much what I'm doing when I first get started before they even touch a weight. Um, and that's kind of periodization, like kind of in a nutshell. D does any of that, does that make sense to you guys? Do you guys have any questions before I move on to the next topic? Okay. So we call that undulating. Non-linear. Yeah, it's non-linear, so like, there would be days we'd be in the gym and the first two days the emphasis would be more of a power. And then at the very end of the week we were doing hypertrophy. So it's... Yes. And I preach the same thing, guys. We, were, we came from the same background. We're like, it's like phasic, we just saw numbers just... And we asked our athletes too. Like that's what we cared about the most. Like how do you yeah. feel? And our baseball players, softball players went around the bases faster than they ever did before. So it's one of those things I think. And I'm not even doing the same pro, I had limited resources, limited time, I only had 45 minutes with football in the offices and that's it, four days a week. And it's still, for that, the squat part of that component like works really well. And what we did was, uh, for the two day programs, it was kind of like, we had, day one was a high day, day two was like, uh, day, no, day one was a medium intensity, day two was high intensity, and if they did a day three on their own, it was high volume, or what have you. Um, and it was the same with the four day, where they would have kind of like high days and low days, but it's, it's, it was a non-linear approach to programming. Now, in regards to requirements, for the people who did raise their hand, you gotta have your master's, you gotta have your CFCS. Doesn't matter what it's in. My master's is in secondary education. It's a checklist, that, that's really all it is. Just have your master's, have your CFCS. For collegiate, if you wanna do high school, and it's becoming more popular to be a, I think what's happening is people are PE teachers, so they do strength and conditioning classes, and maybe they do a few PE classes, but it's a good gig. I mean, the schools that can afford it are usually the, the kind of like affluent schools, so the money's really good. The job security is there, more so than the collegiate realm, but you need the same requirements. Private sector is a little bit different. Private sector, you may not need your CSCS. You may get by with like an NSCA, strength and conditioning cert, but I feel like CSCS is a gold standard. So if you're even considering getting into the field, yes, get your CPT. Um, I think it's an easier test to take. You can even do it online but definitely get your CSCS because I think it sets you apart from the rest and I think it goes into programming more than the other certifications. So even though it's more linear based, you're gonna get more content in regards to how to put your, your structure your workouts in the periodization as opposed to a CPT. You know, sports medicine, they get licensed and everything. It's a little bit more liberal for strength and conditioning. You gotta have your CPR also as well um, and your AED. Um, the hierarchy, Interns, usually it's, you intern, you get a GA ship. For your, your GA ship, they pay for you to get your master's. And then you have teams, so that's cool. You have probably, you don't get the revenue teams, you're not getting basketball or football, but you're getting maybe some golf, some swimming, 
equestrian, you know, um, gymnastics, stuff like that. You're getting tennis, maybe. You're getting those types of teams, but you're getting two or three teams. So you're, you're building your resume and they're paying for you to get your, um, to get your education. Um, and then you become an assistant. I kind of went a different route. I already had my master's when I interned at UCLA. So after that internship, I got a full-time assistant position. So I kind of went, I got my position kind of a different way. I was kind of ahead of game with having my master's. And then if you're at a big division one school, usually there's a head strength and conditioning coach for football. And then there's a director of Olympic sports for all the other sports. So there's basically two head strength and conditioning coaches. One is one's probably got two or three assistants that primarily work with football. And then you've got the director that kind of is the head of all the other sports. Um, schedule, typically six to six is what you can expect, but six to six means who's training at six. So when I was at Northridge Swim, trained at 5.45 in the morning, so I was there at like 5.15. So really it's like six means we start at six, but you got to get there before, and then 6 p.m. means we're finishing at six, but you got to break down. You got to make sure you, you kind of clean up the weight room, but it's typically 10 hour days. That's kind of par for the course. Doing a lot of cleaning and maintenance, making sure everything looks nice, neat, uniform, bumper plates in order, no chalk anywhere, making sure everything looks, hooks and safeties at the right height, making sure that everything looks nice and orderly. Um, it's a job where you're coaching when you're there and then on your downtime you're programming, so you're putting your workouts together, so it does require a lot of time, uh, potentially outside of the times that you're training. And then there's also research, like I had to research the triphasic program to actually put that into play. It took like a month to get that together. And then obviously, you're purchasing equipment and you're, you're designing the weight room once you get new equipment. Um, if you are, is anybody at this point, this is, okay, so at this point, yeah. If you wanted to see what's out there and look at job descriptions, uh, you can go through the NSCA, their job portal. The Strength Performance Network is like a Facebook for strength and conditioning coaches, and you can kind of look at other people, what other coaches are doing, and what other schools, um, what levels the strength and conditioning, you know, is taking place at. You can look at some high school strength and conditioning type of content, collegiate level strength and conditioning, private sector, any of these sites. If you Google strength and conditioning, you can see what's available and just look at the job descriptions. Usually you don't get pay information, but you don't get pay, you don't get the type of teams you're working with, but that's where networking comes into play. So if I'm an intern with you at Alabama, right? Alabama's gonna have a ton of strength and conditioning coaches there. I'm gonna be cool with all you guys. And now I'm in because when they get word of a job, you hit me up. That's kind of how it works. I mean, when I left Cal State Northridge and I was looking for work, I think I applied to like 50 schools. And did I get, I got one interview at Cornell, a, a, a phone interview, and one interview for a school in Boston, a high school, but I didn't get any kind of luck. It's about who you know. But sometimes when I go to conferences, to this day, people come up to me, hey coach, uh, Texas A&M's hiring, and they give you the details that they're not legally you know, allowed to tell you in a job search. They want a female, these are the teams, this is the pay. So it's kind of all about just keeping your network in order because then it's literally about contacting your people and saying, yo, I heard this job's open, can you get me, can you get me in, can I give you my resume? Or they'll call you. If they feel like you put in work when you interned and, and there's somebody that they could put their name on the line for, they'll look out for you. And this is the email, this is what I get from the NSCA pretty much on a daily basis. Whether it's an internship or a full-time position, they'll tell you what school, where it's at, you know, and then you'll kind of get a little bit of a, um, a breakdown of what, what they're looking for, or the position. Pros and cons, I kind of mentioned this before, but, um, you know, I get to wear whatever I want to work. So, that, so that's pretty cool. Um, Coach, I'm not sure how to get this. Uh, Go, you see that box right there to the right? Right here? Just click it. Uh, you yeah, have the like, little square box up right there. I don't know how to. That's a good question, to be honest. There we go. Yeah, there um, so it's a gym atmosphere. I mean, is anybody, is anybody interested in going to work in an office, corporate office? Is that what you guys are into? <laughs> right. <laughs> My very first job ever was an internship my freshman year of college at downtown LA in the law office. And I thought up until that point, that's what I wanted, the big corner office with the view of the city. And I was like, never, when I got out of that job, I was like, I will never do a corporate job ever again. That was like the worst experience of my life. 
Um, so yeah, it's it's a it's a relaxed environment. You get to you know you can wear whatever you want. Um, and you get to make people better, right? I have people who are a mess when they come into my weight room. I mean, there's a coach, strength coach um, at Santa Monica College. They calls athletes like you know like baby giraffes. Like they just they can barely kind of like walk. It's like you get people and you're like, how are you even an athlete? Like how are you even playing a sport right now? And I gotta teach you how to lift. Like you need to go to a PT clinic. But I got 16 weeks to do something with them. And to be able to take that and have them be able to squat, lunge, get stronger, become more mobile, it's, it's a very rewarding experience. I, I get a chance, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to help people get better every single day. Um, and then I think for my female athletes, what's cool is that the, a lot of our female athletes don't have a lot of background experience with weight training. And so, number one, uh, number one, the confidence level is boosted, because now they were intimidated by all this stuff in the weight room, and now they're hungry. They go through that first pretest and they actually see how much they can lift. So they're hungry the next time they put that bar on their back when they retest because they're, they're, they're just, they know that they're more capable. And now if it's softball, they're hitting balls over the wall. Like they're just hitting bombs now. So like, okay, like this works and I'm into this. Number two, I'm at the JC level. So if people don't decide to play sports, I've, I've, I've been able to give them the knowledge to actually work it on their own now. So if they're just gonna be a civilian from here on out, they can go to the gym, and, they, and, they, and they're comfortable. And I feel like a lot of people go to the gym and don't know what they're doing, right? Or they're like looking through magazines or asking for help. Now they're able to take care of their own bodies, whether they play sports or not. The injury prevention is, is huge. Something could sideline an athlete and have them done for the season, but potentially it's a smaller injury now because they're stronger. And so I'm helping people potentially stay healthier and, and not miss the season because, because they're stronger than they were before.